we're now moving to the third scenario, which is uh, dealing with disciplinary and grievance issues. Um, so just reading the scenario, Paul has been employed by a group company for three years. He is being disciplined for allegedly falsifying his expenses, particularly related to mileage claims over a number of years. He says that the mileage claims are higher than they would normally be because his sat-nav sent him to the wrong place on a number of occasions. It was supplied by the company and has not been updated by them. There were frequent roadworks and diversions, and even if the individual mileage claims are incorrect, the total claimed is in fact correct. Um, it's a, 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 a scenario that we've dealt with as a firm, and also a recent case uh, which appeared in the Court of Appeal um, deals with very similar facts. So, um, I think if we can look first of all at uh, the question of how quickly employees get statutory rights uh, in the various countries. Regina, can, can we start with you? Uh, we actually do not have many uh, statutory rights um, regarding disciplinary and grievance procedures. Um, it's a surprise because uh, under Dutch law, many things are arranged. <laughs> but this is a subject, and the only thing that is really arranged in law is the uh, financial penalty. Um, and uh, for all other um, uh, disciplinary uh, issues, you have to look at when can it be reasonable to come to a dismissal for urgent cause. Um, but there can be uh, all other um, um, disciplinary uh, measures, such as written warnings or oral warnings. Um, but these are mainly managed by case law. Okay, and, and Laurie, in an, from an English perspective, how quickly can employees be protected from unfair dismissal? Well, the qualifying period for uh, unfair dismissal rights has gone up and down over the years. Um, for a lot of my career, it was uh, one year, but we're now back up to two years. Um, I, I think this individual we're talking about has got over two years service, which will give them unfair dismissal protection. Um, but if they had under two years, um, uh, service, then very little, perhaps nothing, is required of um, process and procedure by the employer before coming to a decision to dismiss. Okay, thank you. And Olivier? Uh, well, for France, there is, of course, there is a trial period, uh, um, uh, and during the trial period, you don't have any rights. I mean, the, empl the employee doesn't have real rights because you can dismiss him or her for no reason at all. And after that, I would say there is a difference. If it's under two years, there is a kind of unfair dismissal, although it shouldn't probably be called like that. And the employee can get damages, but it would be often less than six month salary as damages. And if it's an employee has got more than two years, has been employed for more than two years, and we're talking of a company with more than 10 employees, then the employee would get at least six months, often 12, and it could, could be up to 18, even 24, but that's, that's rare. Okay, so this employee here who's got three years is, is in quite a good position. Mm, yeah. Yes. And, and Axel in, in Germany. Yeah, in Germany, uh, the um, protection only starts after six months of service. So in the first six months of service, you can dismiss employees uh, without them being able to uh, challenge it at court. Okay, and Regina? And we don't have this term. Um, it actually starts protection from the start of the service. Uh, we have a probation period which can be one or a maximum of two months um, in which you can dismiss without um, mentioning the uh, reasons. Um, but from that time on, uh, immediately all regulations about urgent cause and dismissal for urgent cause apply. Okay, thank you. Now, can I ask, and I'll leave it to Olivia, I think, um, what steps would you advise the company to take when they become aware of the issues that have arisen here? Well, the first step would be to send a letter to the employee inviting him for a meeting, and that has to be within, uh, I mean, it cannot be before five days after he has received the letter. And then during, uh, at that meeting, you will have to explain uh, what you think about the grievance and, and, and to listen to what the employee has to say. That's the first step. Afterwards, you have to leave two full days and the third day after the meeting, the employee can decide either to dismiss, if that's his decision, or uh, it can be a, a warning, it can be anything which is less dramatic than a dismissal. 
and Axel in, in Germany? Is the position similar? Um, the difference is, well, it, it's somehow like in France. I think it's slightly different. First of all, there is no grievance procedure in Germany. The, the two disciplinary actions you have is a written warning and the termination for cause. Um, if we talk about a scenario like that, what you need to have in mind is that a possible result of this investigation could be a termination for cause. And there you have a very short timeline. You, you are only allowed to terminate for cause within two weeks after you became aware of the misconduct. If you have a situation like this where you don't have a proven misconduct but, but only a suspicion of a misconduct, uh, you are uh, you, you, you have to do a hearing with the employee. This is not a, it's not really formal. It's, uh, you don't have to invite, you don't have to mention the, the reason for the, uh, for the questioning in the invitation. It's just you need to formally have <coughs> the employee asked about the suspicion and he, should, he must have the uh, opportunity to give his view on this point. But you can do it immediately after you have dis discovered it. And the moment he has stated what he has to state, you can hand over the termination for cause if you want. <coughs> um, the tricky part is, as I mentioned, the two weeks you have. Um, and that shortens your time for investigation. Um, because the, the risk is if you got to a, a level of knowledge that where a court would say, now you knew about it, <coughs> the two weeks start to, to, to run. Therefore, the, the advice typically is to keep the initial investigation secret so that you have more time afterwards to uh, give notice and to do more inquiries if, if needed. Okay, thank you. And um, Regina? Th that's about the same uh, in the Netherlands. If we talk about um, the, the disciplinary disciplinary measure of um, dismissal for urgent cause. Uh, one of the um, um, uh, requirements under Dutch law is that it is uh, mentioned to the employee um, uh, as soon as possible. There is no strict limit, uh, as in Germany, of two weeks. But as an employer, you need to really make progress with the investigation and do it as uh, soon as possible. So for that reason, too, we try to investigate um, and not let the employee know, do that first secretly also, that's a possibility to um, find out more uh, normally. Um, and then when you get some proof, you can uh, start making inquiries with the employee and then of course he knows. Yeah. And, and Laurie, what would you advise in the UK on, at this time? Well, typically in the UK, you would uh, carry out your initial investigation by gathering together the materials that you say showed uh, that there was a problem with his mileage claims. Um, following that, you would um, typically write to him, inviting him to a disciplinary hearing, um, telling him um, what it was that you thought uh, that he had done wrong. Um, it would be good practice to include with that letter the evidence you had showing um, that he had done wrong. Um, and uh, in terms of the sort of timescales that we've been talking about, typically we'd advise uh, at least two clear days between um, giving the individual the letter and holding the, um, the disciplinary hearing. Thank you. Um, and in terms of giving people or giving Paul um, information about which he might be disciplined, uh, what's the position in France, Olivier? Well, that's an interesting question, and I was surprised uh, to discover that in my country you don't have to explain or to, to, to say why you ask somebody for such a meeting, which is very unusual because, I mean, it reminds me a little of the of Kafka procedure where you ask somebody to, to come to the tribunal, but uh, he doesn't know why or, or, or what you are going to, to, to tell him. So that's very strange, but you don't have to. Although I often advise my client to tell at least a little about what is going to be discussed during that meeting, but it, it's not required by the law. Right, and I think he's right to, and for Axel and, and Regina that you do have to give some information beforehand. No, in Germany you don't have to give information beforehand. You, you do have to give information in the meetings that is sufficient for him to make a decent and uh, meaningful reply to your allegations. 
but you don't have to give any information beforehand. And we would uh, advise to the contrary. We would always advise not to give any information. Uh, also, from a tactical perspective, to use the element of surprise. Um, <laughs> Yeah, people tend to uh, to come up with stories um, to if they know what the what the, the, the alleged mi misconduct is, they may make up stories a bit like Paul with his uh, with his navigation system. Uh, and typically, well, it, I have to say it depends. There are sometimes really very difficult facts like questions regarding calculation of certain things, where it would be fair to ask somebody to look into it, to have a meaningful d discussion afterwards. But if it is a simple fact where you would expect somebody knowing if he drives the right way or not, what is a, it's not a difficult question. Do you drive directly to the customer or do you go by McDonald's or do you visit your mother? It's not a difficult question that you need to prepare for. Um, I think that would be the tactical uh, uh, evaluation behind it if you would disclose it in, before or not. And if, if I can just pick up on a point that Axel made and how it might be relevant to the UK, this, this point of the element of surprise, I know can be quite useful in some situations. Um, it is possible to do something like that in the UK, um, but if you're going to have that kind of meeting, I'd style it as an investigation meeting rather than as actually a disciplinary hearing. Um, I suspect you, you might not in practice need that in this situation where by the looks of it, um, an awful lot of this has simply come out in um, documentation or where you can check sort of mileage from the internet and so on. Um, but there will definitely be some cases where um, either for your own tactical reasons or for very good practical reasons, you would want to hold a separate investigation meeting um, with the individual before then going on to the full-scale disciplinary <coughs> hearing. And very often, of course, the investigation meeting and the disciplinary hearing um, would and should be um, carried out by two separate um, managers moving up the hierarchy. Can I just say, though, with this element of surprise, I mean, it does sort of smack of an unfair process. And also, if, if you presented a witness at the uh, hearing, how would the employee be expected to cope with that? They might have their own witness that they want to bring themselves. And if they're not knowing what they're being called to a meeting for, they won't be able to prepare for it at all. So it does seem rather sort of disjointed, really. It doesn't you know, follow a fair process at all. The question is um, that if you're taken by surprise at such a meeting, it seems to be unfair because you have no chance to prepare or perhaps call one of your own witnesses. Yeah, so this hearing, what we would have to do in Germany uh, in order to uh, justify uh, termination for suspicion, uh, is not meant to be fair. Regina, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want to? In the Netherlands, it's very similar as what you described, Laurie. Um, you can. Normally, there will be first an investigation process. Um, and uh, f before that process, you don't need to inform all the employees. There's sometimes even a forensic uh, investigation, in which uh, two um, mostly former police officers uh, uh, changing careers uh, uh, tend to ask the questions. And, um, and there's a very important thing is the element of surprise. But afterwards, uh, you need to have, uh, I think, what is similar to the disciplinary hearing in the UK. And this is really to give the employee the opportunity to defend himself. And there, all the principles of reasonableness and fairness and equality of arms do apply. And you have to be very careful to give all the information coming from the previous investigation up front and make it possible for the employee to make a good defense. I, I suppose what, what makes it a bit odd, and, and I understand your question, is that at the same time, the employer is the police officer and the judge who decides whether the employee has to be dismissed or not. So that's why probably it's a bit uh, unfair in a way. Uh, maybe I... Uh, I would like to elaborate a bit more on this uh, point that it is not meant to be fair. The reason why it's not meant to be fair is because typically, and this is a process, in Germany every employee receiving a termination for cause would go to court. So the, the question if there is a misconduct would be dealt with in court and you would have to prepare everything 
to prove that it is unfair. And then the employee has enough time to present its case in court saying it, it, was, it was differently. I, I never did anything that uh, is violating any laws or violating any rules of the company. Therefore, the, the process is, I think, philosophically, uh, a lot of what is disciplinary in the UK or in, in, in the Netherlands or in France happens within the company. The German concept is more, the moment you find that you want to separate, it does not make sense to deal with it in the company, you, you move it outside. You move it to the court, there is a judge, everybody presents its case, and the judge is going to decide if this is a, a valid and solid case for dismissal or even not. And as, as the consequence under German law is, if the judge finds that you did an unfair dismissal, the employee is coming back, you better prepare a good case. Uh, because going to the whole court procedure and then having an employee sitting at the desk again, this is bad. And therefore, of course, the, the hearing itself m m may be unfair. And to give you even the idea how unfair it may sound is that very often lawyers do the, 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 the hearing. So I very often do the hearing in, in such cases with the employee and not knowing that I'm there. So the first time he sees me in his life is when I'm sitting at the desk and asking him the questions that appears to be unfair, but if I don't have a good case, I'm going to lose the case in court. Uh, therefore, I think it, it is still balanced. Uh, the question is where, uh, where the, the fight takes place. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, the yeah. yeah, exactly. The, the tactic behind it is that when I go to such a hearing is that I'm going to present the misconduct and the, the evidence we have to convince him that we better settle. And uh, in a good case, so if, the, if there is a solid case of misconduct, the employee ha does not have any interest to make this public. Uh, and in Germany, it, it, it definitely becomes public because you have to do a works council hearing before any dismissal. So in this works council hearing, you would have to describe in detail what the misconduct is. And especially the higher you go up the ranks, the less people are interested to have this information spread through the company. So they are very interested in the communication, inside and outside. They are very interested in a clear cut of date that they can sell in their CV. So they are interested in m many other things that you can agree on in a settlement. And yes, and I have to admit, of course, I use this element of surprise in such a hearing. And if this employee has the feeling, oh gosh, they got me, uh, I really did something wrong. Now they're offering me the way out. The result, more than 50% sign a settlement agreement in such a hearing. Can, can we? Uh, we'll come back to that mm. if, if we can. We <coughs> can get through the, the, the scenario. Um, one of the questions I wanted to, to raise with the panel was the the issue of being accompanied to the hearing by a, a colleague of some sort. Um, perhaps if, uh, Regina, do you want to? Again, no statutory regulations about that, but it is um, uh, often allowed because that will increase the assessment of reasonableness of the whole process. And people tend to bring all kinds of people, uh, family, uh, colleagues, uh, judge, uh, uh, attorneys, but uh, it can be, uh, and it's often allowed. Yeah, in, in Germany, you are always allowed to bring a member of the Works Council to any hearing. Uh, but that's it. Uh, you are not allowed to take a lawyer. You are not, well, you, you, if the company agrees, you can bring a lawyer. But if the comp re company refuses, you, they can prevent a lawyer c uh, from coming or anybody else. And Olivier in France. Uh, in France, no lawyer on either side. I say that because I can understand that in Germany, you can have one lawyer on the side of the employer, but not for the employee. So no lawyer, no. You can have somebody who is uh, uh, employed by the same company who would take notes, who would uh, speak if necessary, and uh, who would uh, accompany the, 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 the person. Okay, and, and Laurie? Um, typically a work colleague or a trade union representative and nobody else can accompany the individual to a disciplinary hearing. Um, the one exception I should mention is that occasionally um, I've worked with clients to allow a family member 
um, into a disciplinary hearing to support a um, employee who perhaps has a disability and where there may need to be a uh, reasonable adjustment made in the hearing to accommodate that disability. Now, one of the things that we see quite often is that employees raising a grievance if they're invited to a disciplinary hearing or actually go physically going sick and being signed off work. Um, Axel, can you tell us what might happen in either of those two scenarios? Yeah, so uh, this is in fact one of the typical reactions you call in sick. Uh, and this is also where you, you, you can't force anybody to come if, it, if the employee is sick. Uh, this would be then if you are in the process of this termination for uh, alleged uh, misconduct, you would do a, 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 a written hearing. So you send a letter with the uh, um, alleged misconduct and give him three days, maybe four days to, to reply. And then uh, uh, the employee would have to argue that he is not even to do, able to do this with his uh, sickness. Okay, so that's presumably linked to the two weeks to, to yes, have the dismissal. Yes, that's pr uh, linked to the two weeks, yes. Right, and, and Regina in, in the Netherlands? Uh, grievance will not uh, impact um, the proceedings. Um, it's always possible to, uh, to raise grievances, but that will go to higher management or a, a confident within the company, but that's separate from the, from the proceedings. Um, calling in sick can um, be relevant because uh, generally we advise clients then to first um, let the uh, employee be seen by a doctor. Um, the doctor will, uh, it's a company doctor, and uh, he will assess whether or not it's real illness or it's uh, illness because of the conflict. If that's the case, then normally the procedure will simply go on and the doctor will uh, advise that the employee is capable of attending the meeting. If it's real illness, if it's something completely else, then it could lead to um, not being able to proceed. Okay. And Olivia, I understand in France, the position is slightly different. Yes, there's no obligation to postpone the um, meeting, even if the employee is sick, which is quite strange in a way, but uh, there is no obligation, although I would advise probably the employee, if there is a good reason to postpone the meeting, that he would agree, he would accept to postpone it once and then give another chance to the employee to come to the meeting. And is there a provision where employees who are sick can attend work for a couple of hours a day or? Yes, pe people who are sick have to stay at home for a certain time during the day because that's, they are paid when they are sick, they are paid by the social security. That's why we have to pay so much on top of the uh, salaries. And therefore, um, I would advise not to uh, have the meeting during the time when the employee has to stay at home because he could easily say that he is not able to go out of his home when he has to stay in case there is a control from the social security. Right. Okay. And Laurie, uh, how might this affect England? <laughs> this is uh, one of the classically difficult questions, um, what you do about a grievance or the sickness during the disciplinary procedure. Um, dealing firstly with the sickness, I think my first comment is that going off sick doesn't necessarily bring a halt to the disciplinary procedures. And the example I always give is that if you are a van driver and you have a broken ankle, then maybe you're signed off sick because you can't drive your vehicle anymore. But there's nothing about having a broken ankle that means, ankle, that, means that you can't face a uh, disciplinary hearing. It's also worth noting that um, employment tribunals themselves require more medical evidence than just your regular doctor's note in order to excuse the employee from attending um, the employment tribunal hearing. So if you are prepared to be robust as an employer, there are opportunities to press ahead um, with the hearing and say, well, I can see from this note that the doctor says you're not fit to attend work, but actually all we want you to do is to attend this short 30-minute um, discussion which we can hold at a time and place of your convenience. Um, you know, please tell us where and when during this week this can happen. Or you try and do things like do it over the phone or something of that nature to try and keep things moving. Um, as for the grievance that is being raised, again, quite common for the grievance to be raised um, in circumstances that are related to the disciplinary matter. Um, Possibly one of the best ways of um, dealing with that is to escalate both the grievance and the disciplinary matter to be heard at the same time um, by a more senior manager. 
um, that can be a way around it if effectively they're both um, wrapped up in the same um, factual circumstances, say that the more senior manager will consider everything um, in the one hearing. Thank you, Laurie. And what are the options available to the company in terms of disciplinary action if they find Paul uh, guilty of what, what he's alleged to have done? Uh, Regina, do you want to...? Yeah, there are various um, um, disciplinary measures possible. Um, the only statutory arrangement is for the financial penalty, but normally in this situation, you, you don't... Um, um, there is no no penalty because you have to agree upon it in writing um, in the employment contract. So that's more for um, and not abiding by non-compete clauses, etc. So it could be a written warning um, or it could be uh, as serious as a, a dismissal for urgent cause. Okay, thank you. And Axel, what might happen in Germany? Yeah, so... Um as I already mentioned, there are two disciplinary actions. One is a written warning. One is a termination for cause. There's not much more that you can, uh, that you have. Um, in this particular case, I think it really depends on how solid your case is. What you need to bear in mind is if you have found evidence, solid evidence, that he really has done wrong in the first place, and secondly, lied on you because he said it was different, it would be very difficult not to terminate for cause because you are setting the tone. And not, it's not a cultural thing, it's also a legal thing because courts say you are bound to your typical actions. So if you typically allow this to happen just with a written warning, you can't terminate the next one doing the same. So it is really not only the question in what you do in this particular case, but also how you want to treat this in general. What is your general, what is your general practice that you bu uh, built with this? And our advice would be, this is so severe that we would recommend to terminate for cause because it is fraud. Uh, it, is a, it, it is when you come to a, down to it, it is a criminal action and somebody's lying on you. It, with these two elements, it's very hard to think about any other case where you, uh, are maybe in the position that you can't terminate for cause because you uh, decided not to do it in this case. And, and Axel, if, if you'd got a situation which was different to this but and where you thought you weren't going to dismiss for cause, could you just issue the written warning without going through a process? Yes. So in Germany, written warnings are not subject to any process. You can any time issue a written warning, uh, you find that uh, somebody may, did something wrong. That's the same in the Netherlands. <coughs> same friends. Okay, and Olivier, going back to the, the initial question um, we, we raised with Axel, what, what, yes. what options are available in France? Well, I would say this is what is interesting in, the, in this case because we, we don't know at that stage whether there is fraud, falsification, or whether it's just negligence because it didn't uh, update uh, the, the, the um, GPS, how do you call it? Not, the sat nav. Sat nav. So, if it's, if it's only negligent, I think I would say a, a warning would be probably appropriate. But if it's fraud, I would say there is cause for um, dismissal and probably gross misconduct. So I would say without any notice period and uh, uh, because that's really, that's really fraud. Okay. And, and Laurie in the UK? Uh, typically in the UK, it's an oral warning, a written warning, a final written warning, dismissal with or without notice. Uh, and very occasionally um, demotion as an alternative to dismissal where dismissal is uh, warranted. Um, uh, exactly as um, Olivia said, we don't necessarily know exactly what's caused this. Um, if it is a matter of honesty, uh, then uh, um, most employers would dismiss uh, without notice. Okay. Maybe something to add for the Netherlands. Um, a very big implication of a dismissal for urgent cause is that the employee will also lose all social security rights. So uh, the right to unemployment benefit. And that's why uh, judges tend to be very, very careful um, to um, dismiss for cause. And that's why generally if a, a case is not that solid in proof, uh, we uh, advise to um, dismiss if there's 
enough evidence, but not for cause. And then there's a possibility on the Dutch law to admit for, admit, dismiss for change of circumstances, which is a little bit lighter, and people can get severance and can get unemployment benefits. So that's a possibility too. Okay, thank you. And in terms of the letter that might be sent out, setting out the decision, how detailed would that need to be? <coughs> and how important is that letter? Uh, in our jurisdiction, it needs to be very detailed and a very important letter because it's the basis for the uh, coming uh, legal proceedings. The judge will really look at the letter and all the grounds that are mentioned in it. If there are certain grounds not mentioned, you cannot later make legal proceedings based on these new grounds. Okay. Axel. Uh, in Germany, there is not such a procedure. Therefore, typically, there is no letter summing uh, up. Um, also, the termination letter itself does not mention any reasons for uh, a termination. Uh, also, there is always a tendency to tell people why they have been dismissed. Uh, our advice is always not to tell anything. The only thing uh, where you have to be very precise is if you have a works council, because before any termination in Germany where a works council is in place, you have to hear the works council. That means you have to give the works council a precise description of what the reasons for the dismissal are. Uh, termination for cause, they have three days with an ordinary uh, dismissal. They have one week to reply uh, to this. Um, they can't stop the dismissal. That's just the information for the Works Council. Uh, but without a proper uh, information of the Works Council, the uh, termination is uh, invalid. Uh, and therefore, as most of the cases in Germany go to court and judges would, the first thing they always do, they see is there a works council and then they look into the works council letter uh, with the information and if they find anything that is uh, not clear or that is uh, misleading, they would uh, 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 rule that the termination was invalid. Therefore, this letter is like in the Netherlands, this is the basis for the whole defense against the, the claim. And Olivier in France. Well, in France, the letter should present the facts very precisely. I would say perhaps not too precisely, because, for instance, if there is a mistake on one of the date or whatever, then you might be um, at fault before the tribunal who could say, well, there is a mistake there, so you, 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 your, the employer was wrong. But I would say it should be detailed, because the tribunal afterwards will have to see whether these facts uh, um, a serious reason for the dismissal. So it has to be quite detailed. Okay, and, and Laurie? I think in the UK it's really a combination of um, what we've heard. Um, I think you should, uh, at least if the person has more than two years service, give a reason for dismissal <coughs> in the letter. Um, if you are confident and know what you were doing, I think I would suggest adding in um, the information to back up that reason, in other words, explaining exactly what your findings are. Um, it can, though, be a little bit dangerous to start to go into detail because if you give lots of detail in the letter um, and then it ends up in tribunal and it turns out there's some more detail that you didn't um, add, uh, then that sort of discrepancy might be held against you. So. Um, unless you really know what you're doing, it's probably better to just simply go with a fairly bland reason uh, or some sort of generic reason for dismissal in the letter uh, for fear that if you do go into too much detail, you'll start to miss stuff um, and that that will cause you trouble later on. And let's assume that Paul doesn't like the outcome of the, the decision, which is, let's say, to dismiss him. What, what rights does he have after he's been dismissed, Laurie? Well, after dismissal, he has uh, the right to appeal internally, um, and it would usually be considered good advice for him to take that up. Um, certainly, in most of the cases that I see, the internal appeal makes no difference, but it's still um, something I think that employees should go through. Um, after that, he then has uh, three months from the date of termination of his employment, uh, within which to contact ACAS for pre-claim conciliation. Uh, and if that is not successful in settling his claim, uh, then he will have to pay a tribunal issue fee, um, somewhere around 300, 400 pounds, um, unless he can get free fee remission, and make an application to the employment tribunal for the employment tribunal to rule on whether he has been unfairly dismissed or not. 
And Olivier, in France, is there an internal right of appeal? No, there is no internal right of appeal. So the employee should go directly to the industrial tribunal. And, and it should be mentioned that he doesn't even need a lawyer or an attorney or whatever. He can, the employee can go by himself, fill in the form, and then the tribunal will have to uh, have the hearings. OK, thank you. Axel, what, uh, what happens in Germany? So in Germany, also no internal uh, appeal. Uh, what is really important, the employee has to file a claim at the labor court within three weeks after receiving the termination letter. Uh, missing the three weeks means the termination is uh, valid by law. So then you lost everything, every possibility to, to uh, challenge the termination. And Regina in, in yeah, the Netherlands? The same is no internal appeal. Um, employee can go to court in case of dismissal. Um, and um, under Dutch law, the period is six months, so, so you have a little bit more time. And um, yeah, you can just claim uh, to be um, to remain your employment. So the, okay. Th that's interesting uh, because I, I think the idea of the three weeks is that if you if you feel to be unfair dismissed, uh, you want to have a decision somehow qu quite soon. If you if you dis if you are able to still claim, uh, file a claim after six months, what, who, who's paying in between? Because the concept in Germany is if, if you go to court, the court uh, rules that the dismissal was unfair and you have to be reinstated, the company has to pay for the time during um, termination until verdict, the full salary. This is the reason why it is three weeks and not six months. So to, to limit this period of and time. That's where it becomes apparent that the Dutch system is different because you need prior permission because ah, when right, um, yes. there's no prior permission and the uh, dismissal for cause, cause is not valid, um, the employee has never left your service. It's mm -hmm. also always been employed. Mm -hmm. So um, you simply have to pay a salary. And in practice, it doesn't happen that much that it will take six months, of course, mm -hmm. because mostly it will be preliminary proceedings because the employee has also um, um, an interest to get his salary again as soon as possible. So, okay, Thank you. Now, I think an interesting area is, is the, the divergence in the tribunal procedures uh, between the different countries. Uh, Olivier, how long does a, a tribunal hearing take in, in France? Well, often during one morning or one afternoon, the industrial tribunal would have to hear between five and 12 cases. In one morning? In one morning or in one afternoon. I was a few days ago in the court in Paris. The room was about a third of the size of this one. And I saw more and more lawyers arriving all in wearing their, their black robe. At some point, there were 60 lawyers in the room because there were 30 cases that were going to be heard in one morning. Luckily, my mind was postponed, but it, it shows that the judge is asking you for no more than five minutes of pleadings for each of the case, and it's very well recommended to just to give the, the file and not no pleadings at all. And presumably the court will have read the, the file before you get there. No. no. <laughs> Hopefully they would read it after. So how long, how long would it take to get a decision from the court? Well, that depends, that. but often it's uh, between one month, but I've seen one year sometime. Okay, that's interesting. And Axel, what happens in Germany? So after filing the, the, the claim, you normally have within four weeks the first hearing. Uh, it's a bit the same like in France, you have uh, 10 minutes per case. Um, and the judges typically try to settle in this 10 minutes. Uh, so you have a very short period of time to make your statement, to convince the judge that you have a solid case, uh, to make the judge convince the other party to uh, uh, agree to the settlement that the, the, the judge suggests. Um, and I, the, the latest uh, statistics I saw is that 70% of all cases are settled in the first hearing in labor court. Uh, so it is really, it, 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 is, it does make sense to prepare for it uh, and to use this 10 minutes uh, as, as well as you can. Thanks. But if you don't settle uh, the decision, then 
a second hearing is mandatory, so you can't, uh, there is no decision in the first hearing, there is a second hearing that is mandatory, that's most of the time between three and six months after the first hearing, and then you have a decision maybe in the, after seven, eight months uh, for the first instance. But you have a second instance, you can appeal, that takes uh, another seven to eight months at least, and you have even if the case is difficult and for some other reasons, a third instance. You can go to, uh, to the uh, su superior court uh, for label law issues and then it takes years. But I, I'm doing this now for 15 years around and I have been to the superior court only three times. It's not happening very often. And Regina, in, in the Netherlands, how, do the, how does the court hit process work? one of the few situations where you would be very happy to be in the Netherlands because uh, a typical dismissal procedure will start with a request for the four weeks later you have one oral hearing which will take maximum of one and a half hours and uh, that's it. Then there will be decision after four weeks. That sounds very interesting. And Laurie, does the English system compare to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, Barry. <laughs> um, uh, typically these days you're looking at getting an employment tribunal hearing maybe between three, six months uh, after the claim was started. can be much longer in particular cases, but something like Paul's, I think we'd be saying uh, three to six months after starting uh, the claim. And Paul's would be listed for a day probably, um, take up a full day of the tribunal's time. Um, not unusual for unfair dismissal cases to take more than that. And certainly if there's any element of discrimination claimed, you're almost certainly looking at over a day. Uh, and some of the heavier discrimination cases, you're talking uh, multiple weeks worth of hearing. Um, tribunals are supposed to then produce a decision within about a month um, of the hearing. Um, I've had bad experiences this year actually with the tribunals. It's peculiar. There's um, much less cases going through, but it seems to be that when they do go to a full hearing, it's taking longer and longer um, to come up with the eventual decision. Um, sometimes you get the decision on the day, but if you don't get it on the day, you're probably talking between one and three months afterwards you're going to get your uh, written decision. Thank you. And Laurie, assuming that this dismissal is unfair, um, what would be the potential ramifications for the employer? Well, if the dismissal is unfair, there is in theory an ability for the employment tribunal to order reinstatement or re-engagement. That is either getting his old job back or getting an equivalent job back. Um, in practice, that happens very, very rarely. Um, I mean, the, the latest stats, even back in the days when there were many, many more employment tribunal claims than now, you were looking at five or six across the whole country um, in a year. So reinstatement or re-engagement uh, don't happen very often at all. Um, more often it's a question of compensation, um, which typically is made up of a basic award um, that's calculated in the same way as the statutory redundancy payment, uh, formula based on length of service, age and earnings. Um, and then a compensatory award on top of that, which is typically based on the individual's net loss of earnings until they could or should have been able to find um, other work. Um, one of the difficulties that we've got with employment law at the moment is that there's many, many different ways in which um, the ultimate compensation figure can go up and down. Um, it can be increased or reduced depending on whether particular um, procedures have been followed, for instance. Um, so if the ACAS code of practice hasn't been followed, you can find um, that the compensation is increased or decreased by anywhere up to 25%. Um, and in recent years, we've seen many, many different ways in which um, compensation can be raised or lowered, um, depending on whether particular things have or haven't been done. Thank you. And Olivier, what's the position in France? I would say between six and 24 months. So not very much. Uh, and Axel, what, what might happen in, in, in Germany? So typically the decision would be reinstatement, so you would have to take the employee back if you lose ultimately. Um, this is, however, for everybody the worst case, for the employee being out of the uh, company for months or even years, for the company uh, not having this employee and uh, undergoing such a uh, uh, process. Um, 
most of the cases in Germany are settled during the way. Uh, only very few are really uh, get a verdict in the end. But if the, the verdict is that the, the dismissal was unfair, you have to reinstate the employee. And um, this can be enforced uh, by uh, uh, asking the court to order the company to reinstate. And the, uh, the threat is uh, either uh, uh, um, a fine up to 50,000 euro or uh, jail for the CEO or the managing director of the company. So you better reinstate. Uh, it is the... Uh, it is too dangerous not to do it, um, uh, but as I said, most of the cases get settled during the way. What sort of percentage? Sorry? Most, you say most, 90%, 80 Yeah, 90%, yeah. And if the and settlement um, is also something that is in the, so nowadays the, the average settlement is 0.5 times salary, monthly salary times the uh, years of service. That's about the figure. It, it depends. If you are shorter with the company, it's a bit higher. If you're longer with the company, it's a bit lower. If you are disabled, it's a bit higher. If you have other things, but the, uh, it's 0.5, it's, so it's an average value. Thank you. And Regina in, in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, you have to make a distinction for the dismissal cases uh, asking for prior permission, which are in the Netherlands most of the cases. Um, if your dismissal is rejected, you simply cannot fire the employee. So there is no reinstatement. The employee never left your service. Um, and you just have to, if you, for example, released him from duties, uh, you have to make him uh, go back to his own job, uh, etc. But during the time, he has always had his salary. Um, if the uh, employee was already dismissed, um, for example, for urgent cause, uh, in which case you don't need prior permission, and it was um, afterwards, it appeared to be an unfair dismissal, so invalid, then you can reinstate or the employee can ask for damages, and these damages can really, um, yeah, it's, it's very hard to say, but it's, uh, uh, it can be it, it, usually around this 0.52, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any, any questions? Many of that. Yes, John. Just rattling back to the, to the warnings, the point in giving a warning. Are they, are they cumulative? So, repeated is smaller misdemeanor, misdemeanor. The question is whether, whether the warnings that we, we talked about earlier are whether they're cumulative. They can be, and if uh, they are, then they can lead in the end to dismissal. So, they add up. No, that's not. Uh, we discussed that before. It, the, you don't need to in an answer, don't need to give a certain period. Uh, they last for a reasonable period. So you cannot uh, call in a warning which is given ten years ago. That's unreasonable. But uh, there's no specific uh, period. No. Same in Germany. And Olivier. Uh, same in France. And I would say that the the the, the problem with the um, warning is that in a way, you cannot use the same facts afterwards for another uh, for dismissal or for another warning. So in a way, I would advise often uh, an employer not to send too many warnings, because afterwards there is no other facts to, 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 to be put together in order to justify a dismissal. Okay. Are there any more questions? Ladies and gentlemen, I could I ask you to thank uh, Regina, Axel, uh, and Olivier, and, and Laurie for their, their very helpful words today. Thank, thank you very much. Um, that ends the formal part of this afternoon's session. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are some feedback forms which we'd be very grateful if you'd fill in because they are very, very useful to us in, in developing this series and other series of, of seminars we do, and also finding out what we did well and what we didn't do well. Um, after that, there's some wine um, back next door, um, and we're very pleased to have seen you all today. Thank you very much.